day, everyone. Today we'll be taking a look at the British American Revolution, aka the most vanilla revolution in the entire game. This revolution gives you your signature revolutionaries, which act as a midway point between a musketeer and a skirmisher. As soon as you revolt, all of your villagers are turned into these revolutionaries, which take up one pop and cost 100 food, effectively replacing your settler units until you're able to send the citizenship card and regain the ability to build new citizens, only these citizens will cost 70 gold instead of costing 100 food. Traditionally, the American Revolution was one of the big push revolutions. It's the revolution that a British player would choose when they decided that you simply had to die or as a last moment of desperation to try and take you out by turning all of the citizens that you were about to rush in and butcher into brand new revolutionaries which could act as a midpoint between a skirmisher and a musketeer. And then there were also just British players that wanted to mix Gatlings with rockets just for the hell of it. Nothing wrong with that either. In the past, British players have chosen the American Revolution for a number of reasons, and at the end of the day it's a vanilla revolution with very easy mechanics to understand, so it has a great deal of flexibility. You can choose the revolution for any number of reasons, and it will probably work with your playstyle. Now let's take a look at those cards and figure out why the American Revolution is such a tried and true basic vanilla favorite. How can this be? First off, there's a card that gives you one Comanchero, plus a Homestead Wagon and eight semi fan Cattle. You can send that card as much as you want. And then there's the Cowboys card. First things first, it sends Cowboys, which only costs one pop, which acts like super cheap Dragoons. On top of that, they can build livestock pens and train cows, letting you quickly reboom by using a few of these Cowboys to make several livestock pens, then train cows for only 70 food, which can then be harvested for 500 food once they're fully fattened. All of these cowboys can harvest from your cows, they can also build more homesteads, so you can quickly have a booming food economy running using what is basically a cheap dragoon unit, which is a common chero more or less, which fires in bursts. And these cowboys only cost 120 food and one pop, and you can train them from your stables after you send the cowboy card as well as your fort, and all of these cowboys in turn can build more livestock pens and more cows and they only cost food so you can have and eat and if you remember your revolutionaries only take up one pop and they only cost food so using the cowboy economy you can easily have as many revolutionaries and cowboys as you want without even having to send in your citizenship card yet the only thing you'll need is some wood for the homesteads which you can get by setting your factories to wood volunteers gives you four sharpshooters per fort that means two things. First off, all existing forts will spawn four sharpshooters, and also any new forts that are built will come with four sharpshooters. Sharpshooters are long-range skirmishers, rather than being hybrid units like your revolutionaries. They... and they can be used to support your longbowmen or any minutemen you call in. Your next card gives you 16 minutemen and it makes sure that they don't lose health. Additionally, it lets you call in more Minutemen from forts. This ability is affected by the Conscription Home City card, and if you send that, then that lets you build even more Minutemen from your forts. They act just like the Minutemen you call in from town centers, but now they won't lose any health. And if you have sent that Conscription card, then you can rapidly build up a very large army of Minutemen to give you an army of skirmishers. Next up, you have your four Gatling gun card. Gatling guns are extremely effective against infantry, However, they tend to struggle against buildings. So in that regard, they're a lot like the organ gun from the Portuguese and should be supported by artillery that's better against buildings, such as falconets or your rocket. After that, there's the two ironclad card, as well as your infinite fort card, your citizenship card, and then there is your Native American allies card. Now let's take a moment to look at those allies. First things first, we're going to start off with the Klamath Riflemen. These bad boys are your basic skirmishers who do well against infantry. Especially nice slow infantry, like say your opponent's halberdiers, so long as you're able to keep out of melee with said halberdiers. Stats wise, your unupgraded Klamath riflemen are more or less identical to the Cherokee riflemen. The difference between the Klamath and the Cherokee riflemen it only becomes apparent if you are somehow able to upgrade them, in which case the Klamath rifleman turns into a long range beast. Without the upgrades, they're decent. 
Like other skirmisher type infantry, they're very useful in the late game because skirmishers do bonus damage against like cavalry such as dragoons. So if your opponent is just spamming nothing but dragoons, something you'll often run into if you go against the Portuguese, then these skirmishers will help. Next up you have your Cheyenne Rider, which is a bit odd as far as cavalry go because they actually counter other cavalry in melee. So while they might look like your standard Hazar equivalent and you can definitely use them to kill enemy artillery, their bonuses are more aimed towards countering enemy cavalry, which makes them unique-ish. Either way, as far as cavalry go, they're dirt cheap so there's no reason not to build them. They also carry a bonus against shock infantry, such as coyote men or shotel warriors, so they're able to take care of those guys in short order as well. Then you have your Comanche Horse Archer, which as you might expect, they act like a normal Cav Archer, where they're able to effectively counter enemy cavalry such as Cuirassiers, so they're a good choice to help protect your Gatlings. One interesting thing about them is that they actually do bonus damage to enemy artillery from range. So as long as you split them up a bit so that they don't all take splish damage from that falconet, you can actually kill falconets very easily without even switching into melee mode with your Comanche horse archers. Which is fun. Next up we have the Seminole Sharktooth Bowmen. They act a lot like crossbowmen, only they have less range and they shoot twice as fast. So as long as they can get close to the enemy, they will utterly dominate the opponent's crossbowmen. They also do bonus damage against Aztec Eagle Runner Knights, so any Aztec player that's dumb enough to let your Sharktooth Bowmen close in will be in for a bad time. And the story repeats itself against any kind of Dragoon type unit, where any sort of Dragoon that's dumb enough to get close to the Sharktooth Bowmen and they don't use their superior range and mobility to hit and run, well, those Dragoons are going to die. Sharktooth Bowmen will mess up a lot of units that get too close to them. By now you're probably starting to notice the theme. What with the revolutionaries and the Gatlings. On top of the before mentioned Klamath Riflemen and your Sharpshooter and your Minutemen, the US Revolution gives the British a lot of long range, high damage options. When you pair these high damage units with another unit like say, your rockets, then you get a force that can basically evaporate almost anything it bumps into. Now you're probably wondering why it's the revolution exactly like this. Well, to answer that question we have to look at a deficit that the British used to have before the latest update. It used to be that the only way that the British could get skirmisher type units would be to either train Jaegers or to send their home city cards so that they could get their rangers. Which meant that there were things that the British really couldn't do. They couldn't kite with their skirmisher type units because their longbowmen were designed to stand and fight and handled very differently from ranged skirmishers. So that's where the American Revolution came in. The American Revolution gave the British their gunpowder skirmisher units. So the British player would be able to choose whether they wanted the range of the longbowmen or if they wanted some gunpowder skirmishers which would be better in certain situations. That has changed a tiny bit now that the British have access to the Rangers card where now the British don't have to go with the American Revolution just to get easy access to a trainable skirmisher unit. However, the American Revolution is still worth taking if only for the anti-infantry Gatling guns. Also, it doesn't always hurt to have more of a good thing. I mean, heck, if you send the Estates card, then you can even train skirmishers from all of your manor houses. So, well, the British deficit of gunpowder skirmishers isn't quite as acute as it used to be before the British update, it doesn't hurt to do the American Revolution and just gain access to more skirmishers on top of Gatlings with every fort and some pretty decent native allies. The British Revolution is a vanilla revolution. It doesn't have too many gimmicks. That said, there's a reason why it's still popular to this day. It's a revolution that works with a number of playstyles. Whether you're going infantry heavy or cavalry heavy, you have options as the British American Revolution. It also lets you supplement your falconets with gatlings. And gatlings are pretty kick-ass. So if it's been a few years since you've tried the British American Revolution, give them another go. 
your monkey brain will thank you for it as your gatlings and your cannons make the enemy disappear. Thank you for coming to my TED Talk, Down with King George.